All right, welcome back to Future Offices Summer. My name is Kevin Steinberger, the director and subject matter expert uh, behind our conferences, podcasts, and now webinars. However, whereas I help to develop such discussions, the speakers here before me today and across the conference are really your best resource when it comes to the future of the workplace, um, especially relating to safety, culture, employee needs, uh, and really the wellness efforts that support these initiatives. Um, again, major shout out to all of our speakers who have taken the time to share their wealth of knowledge um, around what I consider the biggest shakeup for the corporate real estate, workplace, and even office design industry. Uh, secondly, major shout out to our exclusive partners on the program who we consider some of the most relevant when it comes to fixing these industry challenges. But wow, what a lineup that we have here. Capital One, Ambius, Instacart, Zendesk. Um, let's get started with some intros right off the bat. Um, Cricket, we'll go ahead and, and start with you. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Cricket Freeman. I am part of our workplace strategy and design team here at Capital One. Um, so our team is responsible for guidelines, standards, best practices. We're a shared resource across Capital One. Um, so we get to consult um, to all of our design and construction teams across the whole enterprise. Um, so we bring lessons learned, feedback, um, associate engagement, things like that. Um, we're also, you know, big on industry trends, so I really appreciate the invite and um, the opportunity to share some best practices. Um, and then as part of, you know, our return strategy, um, I'm part of that team as well. Um, and so leading, you know, some of the criterion research that has gone into um, our thinking around um, the eventual return into the office. Absolutely. Um, Kelly, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Kelly Wolowski, I am uh, in global account development uh, for Ambius. I've been with Ambius about 25, 25 years now in a variety of different roles. Been with a, a national global department for the last 12 years. Along the way, working specifically in the office sector, um, developing strategies for interior landscape programs throughout that space. I'm really happy to be here to try and assist with that process as we develop uh, reentry plans for many of our existing clients, as well as any customers that may need it, um, the well-being and, and the culture of those companies. So thank you for the invite and uh, look forward to the participation. Awesome. Warren, over to you. I first of all I want to say thank you to Kevin and the whole Future Office team. It's always been a great source of learning and education for me and networking. So thank you for putting this series together. Um, I'm Warren Kleban. I'm the director of real estate and workplace for Instacart. And uh, you know, if you haven't noticed, there's a global pandemic going on out there and it <laughs> looks like people are afraid of going inside. Uh, so we are working on a wide variety of different options and capabilities that our team and workplace personnel can develop and kind of facilitate camaraderie for our employees, as well as really make sure that we're on the cutting edge of what people in our market and other markets are doing to ensure a safe and productive return to the office. Absolutely. Uh, and Danielle, uh, last but not least here. Thank you, Kevin. I'm Danielle Newton. I am the Director for Workplace Experience for Zendesk. And I am really excited to be here and part of this conversation in this moment. Um, it's uh, pretty interesting, all of the pendulum swings that have happened in just the last few months and the way that we are thinking about how to program space going forward, how will we use space going forward, how has this caused shifts in the way that we think about those things. So really excited to be part of the conversation. Awesome. And um, thank you guys for being here. You know, once again, um, I know it's a it, it's a tough time for, for everyone in the industry. So many different webinars and, and Zoom meetings going on, but um, really stoked about this group right here, um, especially with a really 
hard focus on kind of that reentry process um, and how that pertains to employee health um, and well-being. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and just kick it off with a, with a first question. Um, and Cricket, I'm going to throw it sort of over in, in your direction. What does reentry sort of look like right now, um, whether it's currently or, or kind of moving forward, at least for, for your teams? Yeah, so we, um, you know, when we made the, the big exit back in March, um, we did that really swiftly and were, I think, really early adopters to everybody kind of working from home. And fortunately, um, our migration over the last couple of years to the cloud and data has really enabled us to do that. Um, so now we've identified who we're calling as essential. Um, we're still maintaining, you know, a few thousand people that come to the site every day. Um, originally, our CEO came and said, um, let's all stay working at home until Labor Day. Um, since then, he actually a couple weeks ago said, you know what, let's um, continue this work from home environment and let's revisit it in 2021. Um, however, we know that there is a small population that might require some more traditional office space. Um, so in the next month or so, we'll start to try to identify, it would be based on volunteerism, um, a very small, small population um, where it makes sense and the buildings that we can open in the regions that we can open to allow um, a small pilot group to come back um, through the end of the year. Um, and then once we start with that pilot, um, then in 2021, if everything is moving forward, um, we might start to ramp up and, you know, we've started to look at phases of, you know, maybe 10 percent, then move up to 20, 25 percent, and then um, really capping it no more than 50 percent, um, really until there's a vaccine or some substantial um, things change with the virus. Um, but we, we anticipate, you know, we wouldn't get to that 50 percent capacity for, for quite some time. So we're kind of dabbling in the volunteer, very, very low percentage. And then in 2021, we'll, we'll consider kind of that very slow, staggered ramp up um, through, you know, the first half of next year, probably. Absolutely. Uh, and how, how big is that first, I guess, group of, of volunteering um, employees at this time? You know, we did, um, we did an internal survey to try to understand some interest. Um, and we know that, you know, less, less than 20% of people would even really feel the need or want to. And there's by no means any like encouragement or push. It's really for, we want people to understand if you're able to be productive at home, that's completely acceptable. Um, so from initial, you know, initial kind of feelings and some feedback, we're thinking somewhere, you know, between five and 8% um, above what our essential population already is. Um, but it's, completely based on volunteers. So we haven't quite nailed it down, but we think it'll be, you know, a very low percentage at first. Right. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to shift things over to, uh, to Kelly right now, actually. Um, yes. And, and the, the reason I wanted to move that over is, is on that same topic of the, the re-entry phase. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, Ambius has been a partner with us for, for quite some time. Uh, and I even remember that, biophilic design topic being yes. kind of an exclusive topic for, for our shows in the past. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a very new topic, even, even for, for myself. Um, but how has this come full circle? How does this integrate into that, that re-entry plan? Because there is a new, very, um, um, very focused view on health and well-being. Um, and yes. I, know, I know you guys have a, a, a new air hygiene service, which mm -hmm. um, not to say that you were um, solely focused on biophilic design in the past. How does that sort of mesh together now? And sort of what does that re-entry kind of look like on, on your side of the, the, I would say the design sector? Yeah, sure, thank you. And I mean, just to follow up with some of the things that uh, Cricket was saying is we're, we're looking at our client base, talking to our client base exactly as she d demonstrated there. What does that look like? How, how are people gonna come back? How are they going to feel comfortable? What are the psychological needs around that? And when I say that, I mean, you know, it's all about comfort and trying to um, keep the talent happy and comfortable. They're the resource of the company, right? So we do know that um, 
49% of most of the companies around the country are focused on health and safety and ha that's part of their company and culture strategy right now. So how do we make that um, work for them? Um, biophilia, yes, we started talking about that and, and the science around that many years ago, what that means for employees to reduce stress, to increase productivity, um, people have an innate need to be around nature and that's what we're building. Um, as far as the reentry into the workplace, we have to look at what are, we, what are we looking at? If they're essential, where are they working in the workspace? What do the collaboration areas look like? How can we introduce biophilia there in terms of you know, green walls, moss walls, live plant barriers, et cetera, to provide that biophilia element and also keep it safe and healthy? In addition to that, yes, we do have our new Hygiene 360 model, um, which has been used in our company in other parts of the world, and now we're bringing it over um, to the U.S. due to the need of the pandemic. And that is a four-part component um, program where they work interactively to clean the air, um, touch surfaces. It works around hand um, touch, air, um, scenting, and um, a, a check-in basis, an audit system that we provide to the companies to make sure that those standards are being met um, to make, and it's independent and to make sure that they're doing it outside of their own workforce so that that pressure isn't put on their current employees or the staff within the space. Um, that's really important, especially when it comes to air quality now. Um, we've gotten more requests for air um, purifiers and hand um, sanitizers than anything because that's what people are doing around the space. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're looking at those models. Is it 10%, is it 20%, is it 50%, is it phased in, how does it work? And just, it's very fluid, we don't know yet, um, but we're gonna be ready to help people design that and to keep their employees and their visitors safe. Absolutely, and it's, it is, it's, it's really interesting to see even now employees asking about health and safety, you know, matters. Absolutely. Such, such air quality, who didn't even know people were measuring the air quality of, of, of their space, you know, just six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, Danielle, we had spoken about in the past, as, as it relates to the reentry phases, that you guys are looking at, you know, sort of the four reentry levels to determine sort of the, whether it's a remote role or whether it's a physical office role, um, would you be able to sort of walk through that with us a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. When you, when we first started looking at, you know, everybody goes home and it's sort of this like, oh my gosh, what do you do next? You know, and you're drinking from the fire hose a little bit, I think initially, and you're asking yourself, you know, some basic questions, right? Who needs to be back in the office? What essential services need to be happening in the office in order to keep the work from home population working. Um, and so, you know, how do we safely re-enter? What does that capital investment look like? What equipment do we need? What, how long is it gonna take to get some of these air purifiers and things that are suddenly in short supply? Um, and so we, uh, similar to I think what Cricket was saying, you know, are looking at a phased re-entry approach. As we think about, as we looked at the CAD drawings of our offices and where we have desks and seating and so forth, we determined that in order to safely social distance, that maxes out most of our global offices at about 40% of their current capacity. So that's kind of a major like line in the sand, right? And as we, if we think about it in four levels of reoccupancy with level one being right now, which is only the most essential workers coming in to do really basic office tasks. Well, what do we need? Okay, um, you know, does anybody need equipment in the office? Is there something that they need to come in for that's business critical? And so we're looking at that for a level two. And again, similar to Cricket, I think that those are very low percentages. And we really want to keep safety first and foremost, that the idea of if you can do your job from home, let's keep doing that for the time being until um, things in the environment change a little bit. And I think in some of our global regions, we are starting to see a little bit of a shift. Um, in Europe, for example, they're starting to feel like they're in a better place um, and restrictions are being lifted and that sort of thing. 
Um, and so, you know, our level three would be, you know, additional, maybe more of a volunteer, or I have a challenging work at home situation or what have you, um, up until that 40% line in the sand. And then level four is really going to be kind of a more post COVID, whether that's a vaccine or whatever else may happen. Um, that puts us back into a space where we're feeling comfortable occupying our offices at a higher percentage. But as a part of all of that thinking, and I think you were alluding to this, Kevin, we definitely are looking at keeping a higher percentage of our workforce permanently remote. And, you know, what are all of the implications of that and so forth. So um, a lot of new work streams coming up out of all of this. Certainly, and I and I, I recall you had mentioning that you know the the new in office or physical office employee won't necessarily mean five days a week. You know, it'll it, it'll mean something different, and that is really going to come down to the performance part of 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 your workforce, um, and then obviously that that purpose of your space now. You know, really really understanding and finding that purpose for your space as it relates to what needs to be done throughout your workforce. Um, Warren, I'd like to, to shift it over to you, um, specifically on the Instacart side. I know you guys are working on a couple different programs, um, but please, please tell us about sort of what re-entry looks like for, for you guys, um, especially as that relates to, to even sort of your remote strategies as well. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as a company, we had already had quite a bit of our workforce distributed amongst a wide variety of different locations, either food retailers or shift managers or a variety of different tasks. I think the you know, we've recently announced that we're going to be extending our prepare to be remote until July of 2021. Um, mostly to give, I think we had a big group of our parents ERG that we're just so nervous and focused about their school year and their families that, and we also had populations in major expensive metro areas that we wanted to give them the permission and kind of the wherewithal to say, if you need to be somewhere else, if you want to cohabitate with a family member, if you need to seek alternative childcare, this is one less thing to think about. Um, we are definitely planning to prepare to open our offices more liberally to folks who want to you on a 100% opt-in basis, and that we're really going to be utilizing our conference rooms as daily bookable um, to be able to create social distance and then also, you know, really work with our buildings and our landlords for our HVAC program, um, but managing it well below kind of 20% or less. Uh, and also we are trying to think about, you know, novel ways for us to create camaraderie amongst our workforce. I think something that people are really starting to break and miss is just, you know, having a laugh, having a discussion. So we're facilitating some um, outdoor offsite programs and we're facilitating a coffee with a coworker um, program to go and meet and have a socially distanced meeting with somebody who's in your geographic region. Um, whether it's someone you know or don't know, we're kind of putting people, especially into communication, if they're in a new market or where they are, or how they can let people know that they're there. Just to have that conversation about your work, I think is is very important. And I think as we kind of move towards North American winter and the day gets shorter, um, we also want to try to set more things that are able to provide some joy in people's lives. And that's, that's kind of what we're thinking is increase joy and develop camaraderie. Certainly. And uh, again, it's, it, it seems to be this, this balance between maintaining culture, um, but again, providing a safe work environment, wherever that might be. Um, and go, actually going back to e even the safety side of, of even the reconfiguration recon of the office, um, the more and more folks even I, I speak to, including folks like yourself, there has been, you know, a, a, I would say a, a large question mark around, you know, where do budgets sit for that major redesign process mm -hmm. moving forward through this? Um, and that, that has been a big question mark currently. And even moving, I would say, into the new year is, is how do you completely reconfigure space to ensure social distancing, again, even with maybe a, a smaller or not even a planned um, budget for, for the time being. Um, and with that being said, Kelly, I'll shift back over to you. Um, 
I guess, what are your thoughts around, you know, COVID budgets and then I guess reconfiguring a space? <laughs> well, there aren't any COVID budgets that <laughs> I'm being told. Um, you know, people are looking at the essential things that they need to look at, uh, making cuts where they need to make cuts. But I mean, it's all about using the right products and having the right equipment and the right service to maintain a safe environment. So um, utilizing outsourcing sometimes for those services seems to be um, an answer for some of those questions. You can save a little bit of um, revenue there by doing that or within your budget. Um, and certainly we've been looking at that with, with clients uh, all the time. Um, configuring the spaces properly, as, as Warren said, using conference rooms to create social distancing and within that concept, how do we make those rooms feel good and have people feel good about sitting in a conference room, whether it's by themselves or with somebody else for you know, a few days in a row, not being able to kind of move about the space as they normally would. So how can we make that better? Um, those are all conceptual things that we're working through, trying to work within a budget. People are giving us budgets that they need to accomplish certain things in a certain time frame for a certain amount of money. And we're working with them vigorously to do that so that, you know, they can have, they can feel good about asking their employees to come back and the employees, whether it's volunteer, most of it will be volunteer, but they can feel good about saying yes, you know, that they want to be out. They want to have, um, you know, collaboration with their, with their colleagues and be able to have some level of whatever the new normal is, right? Because none of us really know that yet. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and how do we, how do we replicate what people were used to in the office? And I know there has been a, a pullback on certain programs within offices, mm -hmm. whether food, food and beverage programs, um, or specific mm -hmm. amenities, you know, really, how do we replicate that for remote workers? Um, and, and, and I'll turn it over to, to the group again. Um, maybe what, what kind of tips or tricks do, do you all have for maybe replicating, you know, something that was so important to, to the organization or the employees whilst, you know, employees are now at home? And maybe I can jump in on that one. Work. Yeah, so um, part of our culture at Capital One is our, our food service. And, um, you know, if you've ever had a meeting with a Capital One person, it doesn't matter what time of day, we probably have a snack or a food item or a beverage or three in our hands at any time. So, um, you know, as people went home, it was, it was, you know, heartbreaking for a lot of people to miss that from the office. Um, to support those essential associates, we, we of course did what we needed to do to keep people healthy and we've really limited our food service. You know, I know Danielle's done a similar thing. Um, and now we're revisiting how we can, um, we're doing a mobile order and pay. So the people that are there mm -hmm. can actually pre-order. Um, so it's somewhat customized instead of like a pre-packaged, predetermined meal option. It's actually, mm -hmm. you can choose what you want, customize it. And it's just that you go and pick it up at a specific place. So it's a little bit more managed, um, within the workplace. So we're rolling that out for the people that are on site. Um, for those of us that are, um, working at home, we are working on, um, some offerings very similar to what you see, you know, like HelloFresh or Blue Apron or, but it would actually be supplied by our cafeterias. Um, and so there's a couple of programs, whether it's a snack pack where you can, um, you know, send things for like a specific team meeting and you get your snacks and they're, you know, mailed to your house. Um, or more of a self-order situation where you can do like a heat and eat where it's already been prepared family of four or whatever, and you heat it up, or more of the chef experience of all of the ingredients are prepackaged, but you actually cook at home. Um, so we're starting that in addition to, um, you know, hosted um, classes, art classes for, for children and family. We're encouraging um, people to, to weigh in, and then we're, we're, we have some artists pulling that together as a as a mural that will be displayed on site from when we were all working from mm -hmm. home. Um, and other, you know, fitness programs using our, our fitness um, trainers right. that are, you know, not at the site now, but, but doing some online um, classes as, as well. So we're really excited to bring some of the things that we miss from going to the office to, to, to home now that we know we'll be here a little bit longer than we 
originally thought. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, well, if you have any extra gourmet meals, um, feel, 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 feel free to take my address and send them. Yeah. <laughs> send you a snack pack, a pre-made from one of our chefs. They're fantastic. <laughs> That's amazing. And um, Warren, jumping over to you, I know um, we had spoken about a little bit beforehand as well about your outdoor offsite program, yeah. um, which, which, which does relate to you know, conquering some of those challenges that, that Cricket had, had raised. Um, could you dive into that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think if there's now, like, as, there, as things start to settle down or there's less coronavirus and people are feeling a little bit more comfortable, we're offering teams or ERGs or, or just groups of people the ability to meet up and, and for us to be able to facilitate for them. Um, so we've, you know, looked into a variety of different locations like uh, Spark Social, which is an outdoor um, uh, like food truck venue that has some spaces for us to be able to maintain social distance within. Um, we've piloted a couple of them. It went really well. It's it's surprising how energizing it is to see some of the people you used to see rather regularly. Um, and, you know, we developed the program along with the, the leader, kind of what their goals are, and we help facilitate the day to make it what they need, provide all the PPE equipment, and then made, you know, not like we want to be a police force, but also kind of actively enforce you know, what is our desired distances and locations and, and efforts. And again, it's 100% opt-in. And I think also wanting to support people to just get out of their house and, and meet with another colleague is something I'm, I'm pushing for. I haven't gotten it yet, but really would like to put some um, stipend towards the ability to have money for a coffee, for people to just get up and get out and have the, have the impetus to do that. Um, the thing I, I'm really now like mentally prepared for is, you know, as someone who personally has some challenges around the winter, um, kind of doing a few things like a cookie exchange where you drop cookies in people's homes or a pie bake off and then, you know, making multiples and sharing that with your employees and just keeping things fun and light. Um, because, our, you know, our work is still very busy. We do want to keep it food focused, um, but that we are social beings by nature maybe not all needing the same level as everyone else but we want to mm -hmm. make sure that we're maintaining the ability to stay connected to your employees absolutely and and it's it's fantastic to see all these programs being put into place that are really capitalizing on that on that safety piece too you know people mm -hmm. people want to feel involved and they also want to feel safe and that's really hard and I had heard the term a couple of weeks ago, non-collaborative collaboration, because <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to collaborate without actually physically collaborating. Um, and that has been and that has been very tough because um, you know, how long can you, you know, utilize um cameras and and digital mm -hmm. meetings um until you know the the maybe the introverts at a company can actually be a little bit more introverted. Um, um whilst they're on you know a, a technology platform versus actually in person um but finding that balance between inclusion and and safety has been has been really tough for a lot of folks in the industry um and even going back to that that safety point um a, a lot of the research shows that and and we had brought this up earlier as it related to air quality that half half of employees believe that that it's their employer's responsibility to provide you know safety measures which include indoor air quality um and kelly i might i might throw this back over to you so like when looking at indoor air quality air purifiers whatever it may be what what are those qualities that that companies should be evaluating on that front and that's i think the gap where people don't necessarily understand right so they should be evaluating the delivery rate of the of the clean air, how often it is moving through a filter, um, how it's coming out. So our our systems that that we work with are standalone systems with throughout the space on the floor. Um, they cover 700 square feet, roughly. Um, so those it's about positioning the equipment properly, and it's about the type of system that it has and how much how what is the delivery rate of the clean air that's really important um, because if the system is not accurately moving the air properly you could have many systems many pieces of equipment not doing the job 
So that's got to be measured. Um, it is, from what we're seeing, it is the responsibility of the employer to do that. Um, if it's through HVAC, it's usually working with the building management team. But employees can't see that if it's with HVAC. You can't see what's happening. And I think there's a comfort level there knowing that equipment is on the floor, what it is, how it's working, how it's put together. Um, and that's made, that should be made available so that they have a comfort level there as well. Um, but really, that's what we're measuring, and that's that's what's important. They're using the HEPA filters, using the proper equipment. Right. Um, it's the same thing with hand sanitizers or um, any of the other um, hygiene equipment that you're using. You know, you've got to make sure they're accessible to people, that they see it, that they're using it. Um, and it it's a little bit of a culture shift, but I think now it's everywhere. So by, hopefully by the time people get back to the workplace, it'll be, you know, hopefully second nature to do that. And the product will be there for them to do it. Right. Um, and I remember um, taking a tour through um, uh, Bloomberg's office mm -hmm. um, not too long ago. And they have, you know, a lot of air pur uh, purification yep. systems and they, you know, they show you the air quality in each room that, you know, anyone can see it. Um, yes. And they had made note be careful putting this up in your office because it might show off, you know, some air quality that, that might not be, you know, favorable for, <laughs> for employees to see, which I thought was, which I thought was really funny. Um, yeah. But again, with that being said, the, the safety stemming back even to things like air quality and employee health and wellness and well-being has become so top of mind. Um, we had a conversation not too long ago with a representative from Google that let us know this is a major recruitment tactic for companies. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of necessarily putting their amenities first, they're putting their safety first. If, mm -hmm. if they can have maybe a, a safer office moving forward, they might, but might be able to grab talent um, over someone else. Um, and that was a very interesting point um, because I think for, for a lot of employees, it had always come down to choice of space, um, amenities and really sort of that employee experience uh, that sometimes excluded health and wellness and safety in the past, um, or at mm -hmm. least there wasn't necessarily a, 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 a strong emphasis specifically um, on health and wellness or, or, or safety mm -hmm. in the office. Yeah, that's completely, you're right on point with that. Um, and, and companies are looking at that. They certainly, at, at, as a member of a large company, we look at that as well. Right. So I think it's really important to make sure that we're equipping, you know, the work, the workplace, and the people that are making those decisions with the proper information and equipment to do that. Right. Um, whether it's tech, um, any other kind of office professional, uh, financial, etc., the goal is the same in terms of safety. So that's one place where we kind of all connect, you know. Absolutely. Um, and um, I'm actually going to throw it back over to, to you, Danielle. Um, everyone that, that we've been talking to have, have been in sort of a, um, um, a different time zone, I would say, of their strategies and initiatives moving forward. Um, a lot more folks obviously know now what maybe questions need to be asked and what certain strategies need to be put in place as compared to four or five months ago. Um, but again, a lot of, there's still a lot of unknown as we move towards the new year, um, especially because we're, you know, sort of waiting for certain global efforts and, and, and certain um, geographical areas that have different rules and different policies. Um, and pretty much my next question was, is um, Danielle, I guess, do you guys have a, have you set in place maybe a longer term strategy have have things been more of a short shorter term strategy that could turn into a longer term strategy? Sort of where where does your team sit? I guess on that strategic process um, as we sort of you know navigate past the summer and and, and into the fall. Yeah, we are definitely um, in the phase of 
creating framework for and kicking off work streams around longer term, you know, and I think that in this call, we've touched on a bunch of the things that are shifting and changing. How do you drive engagement and culture and training in a more distributed world? How does the food and beverage program look like? And again, how do we avoid sort of a haves and have nots um, type of a situation? If you know, some teams have a higher remote population and now they're talking about, you know, um, we will be 60% uh, remote, but I need my whole team in the office twice a month for mm -hmm. X, Y, Z. You know, how do we as a workplace operations team um, program the space? How do we staff appropriately? How do we um, ensure that we can accommodate some of these new ways of working. And mm -hmm. so within Zendesk, certainly we're kicking off a number of new work streams, really thinking about at the center of all that we do really need to be a culture and our employee engagement, right? And so all of the things that come around that, whether that's our real estate strategy, our workplace operations, how are we working, how are we re-entering, um, and all of those pieces really feed that center, that center hub of culture and engagement. So that is kind of the next big frontier and top of mind for us at Zendesk for sure. Absolutely, and, and, going, and going back to that remark just around the staff, um, Cricket, I remember talking about specifically just instructing employees on stricter protocols, rules, and, and even regulations in the office, which even stems into sort of a change management process for, for, for everyone at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've really ramped up on our change management, um, you know, communicating to associates what to expect. Um, so there's nothing caught off guard. You know, we do know that um, in our short term, you know, it will be very much like working remote in an office if you choose to come to a more traditional office space, um, you know, because the population is going to be so low, you won't have some of those things that you expect from a traditional office, um, you know, because a lot of people just won't be there. Um, but then as we slowly ramp up, you know, communicating and um, really helping people understand the experience to expect before they arrive. Um, we've started to do some, you know, videos and talked about, is it a format of, um, you know, CBTs or, or um, some other, you know, what's the best way to ensure that people are getting the resources that they need to be prepared when, when the time is, is here. Right, um, and, and really rebuilding um, going back to the camaraderie piece as well, Warren, that you had mentioned, rebuilding that employee confidence. Um, and and mm -hmm. Kelly, I know I know your team has, has worked hard on that um, and really just understanding what are the new expectations, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the workplace. Um, and and what what are you seeing that that employees are looking for as they, you know, consider returning to the office? Um, and, and that's very hard to understand across a multitude of sectors, a, multi a multitude of different offices in different locations. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, how do we rebuild that employee confidence and, and, and what do they expect as they, you know, return to the office or, or not? Yeah, I, and I, I would go again, I, I would go back to some of the things that um, Cricket was saying. I think you need to be, have the preparedness is very important. Um, the communication around what is the plan. Um, that's really important. Um, you have to be able, they have to have a level of, there's a level of trust there that um, is needed because this pandemic is just so fluid and there's so much information out there. Um, you can, you know, offices can only control what they can control. And in these cases, it's the provisions that they can bring in to do that. Um, so it's about communicating that and being able to deliver it, of course, um, that lets people uh, build that trust. Um, that's a huge psychological benefit of coming back to the workplace, we believe. And part of that whole biophilia you know, experience relies on that information and it being true you know, and deliverable. Absolutely. Um, and we're, we're running short on time here. Um, Warren, I'm wondering when the next time, you know, I can 
come visit, you know, one of the, the Instacart spaces for a site tour. Um, I know we've done a, a couple of those. In the oh, past. No, I hope soon, but probably <laughs> not. I know. We're probably no visitors <laughs> till 2022. Yep, yep. Um, so maybe at some point a virtual site tour or, or, or something. I mean, Kevin, I just like, I haven't had a 99 cent slice since last year. And, <laughs> you know, the pizza here, especially delivery is just like expensive and not particularly good. So I would love to be in New York. Thankfully I was there in <laughs> December last year, but you know, I miss movement. I miss date night. <laughs> I miss a restaurant where I, like the dishes aren't paper and I can eat out, but you know what? I'm okay. My family's okay. We're doing our best. And, you know, the pandemic of 1918 didn't last forever. So I'm hoping this one doesn't. It's just, as you're in the middle of it, it feels indefinite. And I'm just looking forward to getting outside as much as I can this summer because I'm afraid of winter and fire season. <laughs> well said. Um, what a way to, to even wrap things up. Um, leave it in on a positive note. Love that. Um, but we are out of time. Um, again, thank you so, so much for, for taking the time to, to jump on. I know there are a thousand you know, webinars and Zoom recordings, but we had an all-star all -star panel here, all-star conversation. Um, again, it really means so much to, to even the program for, for the insight um, to what you and your teams are doing. Um, and once again, Cricket Freeman, uh, Workplace Strategy and Design with Capital One, uh, Warren Kleban, uh, Director of Real Estate and Workplace at Instacart, Danielle Newton, Director of Workplace Experience at Zendesk, um, and Kelly uh, Wolowski, Global Design Consultant with Ambius. Guys, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Bye. Thank Be you. Safe. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>